Hi, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, can I also ask uh, for uh, one of our online speakers to be joined in? Thank you. Thank you so much, panelists, for joining us today for a great point of discussion. And I have a set of great panelists with me, entrepreneurs, uh, investors, and from co the corporate side of it and few leading the new age technology in the healthcare space like AI. So I'll just give 30 seconds to each one of you to quickly introduce the work you have been doing and then we'll just get into the discussion mode. Hey folks, uh, Rohit here. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Cloud9 Group of Hospitals. Um, ran this for about 17 odd years uh, before deciding to go onto the dark side as they call it, uh, to get onto the investing side of things. Uh, it's been another passion of mine to pursue investing in other founders, so uh, made the switch about a year and a half back and set up Payer Capital. Um, so we're an early stage fund, we invest across health, fin, and uh, consumer tech largely, um, early stage. And you know, just using our uh, diverse background across entrepreneurship, uh, risk and growth, and uh, one of my partners actually a VC himself, so bringing a diverse sort of experience to try and take the discussion away from pure capital as a commodity and uh, hopefully we'll try and bring a lot more founders to the fore. So that's me. Uh, hi everyone, I am uh, Mudit. I am CEO and co-founder of Dozy. Uh, we started Dozy almost eight years back with a vision that, you know, why uh, the uh, highest grade of care needs to be restricted only to ICUs, right? How can we get ICU grade care to each and every patient bed, be it uh, you know, a general ward in a hospital to a special ward and even to the patient at home as well, right? So we developed this contactless remote patient monitoring sensors, proprietary sensors, which are now FDA cleared as well. And then using AI, uh, we identify, uh, you know, one, we continuously monitor the vitals of the patient without even touching the patient. And then using a continuous stream of data, and using AI, we escalate patients in time uh, using early warning system, currently present in more than 200 hospitals across India, including few of the biggest of the names like Apollo, Mani, uh, Apollo Narayana, Easter, and many, many more, uh, and present right now in India, UAE, and in US. Uh, so that's Dozi. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Manu Dev. I'm the chapter lead for data analytics engineering capability in uh, Roche uh, Information Systems. Uh, so my background is in uh, software development and software research. And uh, we have been focusing on uh, looking at applying data analytics capabilities in the digital healthcare applications, trying to really modernize the healthcare application ecosystem and uh, looking at novel technologies we can apply to improve the lives of patients. So, it's about me. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Vishnu Um I'm an orthopedic surgeon turned health tech entrepreneur. Um, so, currently, uh, if you might have heard about Hanuman and Bharat GPT, so we are the ones who have launched it. So it's a generative AI uh, ecosystem we are trying to build for India. And when it comes to health tech, uh, so we have a Boston-based company called Vizi. And uh, Vizi is bringing another cutting edge technology to the health tech. It's multi-omics. Now we call it as meta-omics, where we are bringing uh, you know, in-depth sequencing like genomic sequencing, proteomic sequencing, metabolomics, and gut microbiome. And uh, connecting it to the generative AI to understand no, currently we see that healthcare mostly happens with tip of the iceberg, you know, like uh, we are seeing very small panel of blood markers and physical parameters to understand most of the diseases. Uh, we are going much deeper into understanding this and connecting this whole thing. So that's what Vizi is doing and uh, out of the research which we did for Vizi, uh, we have been able to uh, bring India's first uh, foundational models uh, called Hanuman series. Uh, so, th th this is me. Thank you. Thank you. So, Rohit, uh, I'm first going to come to you because you wear two hats, one of an entrepreneur and one of an investor. And uh, on one side, you're running a traditional business of hospitals and on the other side, you are making investments in the health tech space particularly. So, how do you see these two worlds, uh, I mean, 
coming together in today's time and uh, how tech is actually revolutionizing this entire healthcare space because you have been in this space since long. So what kind of evolution you have seen? You have seen? Oh, there's uh, actually it cuts across several things, right? There's services, there's products, um, and there's new age dimensional thinking as uh, uh, you know, he just mentioned. Um, the way that we see it actually is, uh, you know, twofold. One, I think whatever in our country, right, uh, you know, there's, there's recent discussion about, you know, capping prices and so on, right? The question has always been about access to healthcare more than anything else. So I think everything comes down to saying, you know, what is the role of technology to amplify some of this access? Um, so I think there is anyone who's kind of looking at it from a one-to-many aspect to say that, you know, if there is a way to actually be able to transfer technology from one single source and actually be able to benefit a lot of multiple use cases at the same time, I think there's a lot of merit to how technology can be perceived. Um, there are the traditional ones in terms of, you know, just within hospital ecosystem, there are so many other efficiencies that you can bring in. Anything which is clerical or rudimentary or repetitive in nature, there is obviously technology plays a good role in bringing in efficiency. Anything which is medical equipment linked, right, uh, from what Mudit is building to uh, traditional systems to what Roche has and all that. There are so many various touch points which goes into delivering personalized healthcare. So we're still far away from being able to use technology as at, at its best to be able to unlock real value. We are still, I think, at the fundamental levels trying to push certain amount of efficiency and such. But I think there's a lot more which can be done there. Um, especially on some of these things. I have this one mantra and you know, I'm sure all of these guys will also agree. I think any um, you know, progressive technology, I actually bring it down to two, three separate things, right? It has to have passion, it has to have purpose and it has to have profit. Um, so, you know, this, this you know, it, it always starts with a passion. Somebody has to have an outlier thinking to say why something needs to be done differently and that's where it starts. There has to be the whole essence of, you know, when I say profit, doesn't mean literal sense of profit, but it has to be that, you know, multiple people should benefit from it, right? It has to have an impact of that nature. And the purpose is something which comes as an amalgamation of both of it together. I think this is the core essence of how one should look at healthcare. And, you know, technology has a great way to go. There is obviously the government, which is playing a huge role in terms of putting the national health stack out there, um, encouraging a lot of people to kind of update their digital records. Um, we don't have... And everybody calls it like the other sort of equivalent, right? In terms of, you know, put all your information in one place and it opens up the UPI card rail sort of thing. But traditionally in healthcare, there has never been that amount of regularization or, you know, regulation to actually insist everybody to generate data in one particular manner. So it will be harder for people to kind of come and subscribe. But yes, do we generate enough data? I think we generate possibly countries put together, we generate more data. But unlocking the value of it, I think it will happen stepwise and we'll get there. So I think it's a very interesting point in our uh, current stage of where we are in terms of you know, what's the use case of technology. So very excited. I think it will go towards personalized healthcare, cut across enterprise, cut across direct to consumer as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunities upcoming. So Harshit has also joined us online. Hi Harshit, are you able to hear us? Yes, hi. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, and hi. Apologies, I could not hear in person. And it looks so strange to look myself so big on the big screen. <laughs> okay, we just had a round of introduction from each one of them. So if you could also just briefly introdu introduce yourself for our audience and how you are actually making a difference in the healthcare space. Sure. Uh, so uh, my name is Harshit and uh, I'm a physician by training. Last I uh, practice was internal medicine back in uh, 2006. So, been a long time since I practiced, but I've been through an exciting journey in the last uh, few years. Built two startups, first in the health technology and big data space for the US market, second in the healthcare communication space for the Asian market. I did well, got decent exits, and spent about seven years in advertising, uh, working in a large advertising agency in global leadership roles. Started with India, then Japan, then UK, and then back to New York. And three years ago, I decided to quit advertising to start another business called DoCare. This is to address one of the unsolved problems of pharmaceutical marketing, 
is to how to engage with physicians on digital in a measurable and a transparent manner have been on an exciting journey since then. You, I mean, uh, how do you think? I mean, uh, these kind of different apps which are actually uh, coming in the market in the healthcare space and uh, revolutionizing change. How are you working with them? So, one of the opportunities we see right now is uh, we all have uh, mobile devices and wearables and all of that, which just generates a lot of data, which makes available a lot of the digital biomarker data that we can use not just on the preventive healthcare side, but also use the same technologies in clinical trials. So those are the two technologies, the two areas where like if we can crunch through the large amount of data that uh, digital biomarkers represent uh, with uh, things like continuous monitoring, which generates just more uh, data points during a clinical trial, it makes uh, this whole uh, capital intensive super long process much more faster and easier, much more accurate. Uh, but, those, but those need uh, the right kind of uh, machine learning and analytics and AI technologies to be applied. And they also need the right kind of trust to be built on these so that it can go through regulators and it gets accepted across the industry. So those are the areas uh, with uh, clinical trials as well as preventive care uh, where the digital biomarkers and how we deal with them with all the new technologies that we have on our plate to be really transformative. And there is another angle when we talk about digital biomarkers and how we deal with uh, data with these new technologies is also about the ethics and the regulatory framework around it, especially when it comes to um, uh, making healthcare decisions based on them. And that is something um, along with technology um, uh, where we are still have to mature quite a bit, the ethics and uh, regulatory framework also have to be matured with the help of governments, with the help of researchers, and with the help of society, so that they can actually allow us to do all of these wonderful things that can help the society. So that's where I think uh, we have a lot more space, and uh, that's where I see a lot of action hopefully happening in the next five years. Coming to you, uh, I mean, the question we all have on our minds is how is AI actually going to revolutionize this space and what kind of work, uh, I mean, you have seen evolving and uh, what does the future look like uh, with AI uh, leading the healthcare space? Uh, yeah. Um, so, AI is in different stages when it comes to being utilized in healthcare. I work mostly in uh, next generation generative AI. Uh, there have been a lot of traditional models which have been used in uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, companies like product companies, health tech companies, where because we generate a lot of data these days. So especially all of us are generating some healthcare data which is being used by you know, Google or Apple with, from your watches. But the current problem is this is called wellness data, it's in different place. You go to the hospital, they generate a lot of data, they take your x-rays, they write case sheets, or they write some patient records, that's stored separately. And you have your own lab reports and all. So everything is lying down in different, different places. Though we are generating a lot of data, it's not like uh, FinTech data, which is collated, banks have it. Virtually now, if I give my um, bank card, then everything is there in my civil report. So most of uh, fintech data, but healthcare data is something which is in silos and everyone has it, uh, bits and pieces, we are not able to summarize it. That's, uh, that's a big challenge, but also a huge opportunity, especially for a country like India, because we don't have any legacy problem of EMR systems which are very big, where we need to do that. So we can just leapfrog, I feel like how FinTech leapfrogged, uh, other kind, we, we didn't use virtually card system, right? We directly came to the UPI. Uh, that's where we are trying to work on. Hanuman's first use case is going to be, you know, healthcare, where we are saying that 
you have all your records, you go to a doctor, you carry so many files, doctor has its own record, so it's all not transferable. Can we, you know, uh, summarize all that records and then keep it? So that's, that's one thing which we are like uh, uh, trying to launch, we are working on it. Uh, it came out of a uh, lot of research we had to do, especially because these records are in OCR formats, PDF formats, text, image. So it needed a huge capability, especially the, uh, to crunch all this, we needed GPUs. Um, so we, we have like quite large number of GPUs to enable this. Um, I think this is, uh, this is a place where India can really do it uh, very well, especially with uh, National Health Digital Machine also coming up, where they are thinking in these terms, uh, because uh, we have other data, we have so much of data, so if we can put these records, summarize it, then virtually any hospital can use it. So there is so much redundancy, right? Like so much records get repeated, you have to do tests again, so much is also lost in translation. All this can be, so that's going to be our first use case which we are like working with uh, NDHM also. We are talking about this. Uh, Multiomics is something which we do as a, a company, but uh, this is a, a made of a public usage. We feel like, as you know, Rohit was saying, uh, purpose and you know, profit and can everyone use it. We feel this is one very great use case for generative AI to be, you know, virtually any, uh, no, uh, domain in the uh, healthcare, like whether it is pharma, hospitals, or your own thing, you can use it, especially on a large scale. I India can, re India is really sitting on like huge data, and 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 this is very precious. Uh, but if you can, you know, use this, really it will change. It will be a big game changer for healthcare. Sure. So. Just, just wanted to add to that. Um, one of the things, especially, and you know, he's a doctor. He's a doctor. They'll all agree that uh, you know the the ability to use technology. I mean, it's it's not simple in the in the consumer sense of you know when all of us think of um, healthcare as a consumer, we just we want to understand why is it not not more transparent? Why is it not more trustworthy? Why is it not more simple? Right? But I think the clinician in the ecosystem is a very important player in the entire midst, right? So I think AI in healthcare, you know, uh, the whole word, word artificial, you know, um, I've been telling people that I think probably in healthcare, we should call it assistive rather than artificial, because that's really what it is, right? Because I don't foresee a future where, you know, we can replace doctors. I don't think that's going to happen, right? You still need the human element to be able to take those decisions. So I think the whole concept of if AI can be looked at as assistive intelligence where you can make decisions better, you can actually improvise, you can act faster, I think that's where the real opportunity is, right? With all the technology available, I think for us to purpose build into something which is usable, I think is most important because a lot of people discount the influence that a clinician has in the entire delivery of technology eventually. Right. So I'm sure Mudit will also add to that, right? But that that uh, you know insistence of or uh, adoption within the clinician ecosystem, I think, is sacrosanct. And I'd love to get the doctors to also weigh in on this. And you know, what's your view? Sure, uh, Mudit, uh, you have actually been highlighting the power of AI and uh, using it in patient monitoring and early detection. So tell us more about it and the use cases. So the way uh, we have been leveraging AI, right? Uh, so we have been using AI in different forms. What has now changed is AI is becoming more forefront. It is coming in the, uh, you know, right in the interface of it. But all throughout AI has been there one way or other, right? Uh, more so like, you know, the use of AI in Dozy was converting raw vibration data, you know, which come out of uh, the every heartbeat, every respiration cycle, body movement, pressures and all of that, consuming all of this data to generate it into human consumable biomarkers, right, is what we were leveraging AI for so far, right, uh, and then using AI to then, you know, understand which patient is going right now into high risk zone, 
because all our protocols are not really made for that all our protocols are currently made for acting upon three or four or five values and how they have been trending but suddenly as soon as you have something like dozy which converts your spot checks into continuous stream of information right what used to be four or five data points is now becoming more than 10000 data points in a day right that is the second place where we have to use ai because human cannot consume so much information imagine uh, in a place where nurse to patient ratio is 1 is to 10 or 1 is to 20 right she cannot consume so much information so how to give this information in the best possible way so that corrective action is taken that is the second use of ai and the third that we are now seeing right is uh, you know quite you know as a cool generating ai use cases as well right that as in someone can ask how many alerts were there for this patient or you know uh, this patient how uh, the progression of a particular vital parameter has been over time and it you know answers it in a way in which human can consume it but i you know uh, completely agree with what uh, rohit was saying right ai is an assistive technology in this entire thing that you know how we can make because healthcare is a very unique field in which it will be always human driven right you can't uh, you know in healthcare right the entire concept is for healing and care i don't think you know removing removing the human element out of it any anybody is going to like that right so how are we going to make humans more efficient using technology right that is the entire ball game of it that's where we are seeing the application of uh, ai so far with what we have seen the impact can be huge right because whatever we have done so far we are seeing how this is translating into same hospitals similar setup same humans having certain number of code blues bed falls you know pressure injuries hospital acquired infection you know put a technology and ai over there and it all reducing to zero right in india right we have seen that happening right so use of technology to make similar setups much more efficient i think that's what technology has always delivered and ai is just another technology right which has come in today right and we we really need to see it that way i believe sure so harshit i'm going to come to you uh, i mean since we are all discussing about ai and uh, you have also used that in uh, pharma particularly the ai analytics so uh, can you throw more light on that yeah sure so uh, thing how i look at this space is i kind of uh, divide it into three parts right first is data collection right where all the data is being collected whether it is a readable or a lab report or how a doctor patient interaction right a lot of action is happening in this space right in fact more so in healthcare so 30% of all the data that is collected in the world is healthcare data right the second is building connections right how can these data that we are collecting start talking to each other right this is where there are very limited initiatives that are being done and that's the reason most of the data right and this is more of a global picture right is lying in silos right this does not talk to each other and there are multiple reasons for that could be regulatory reasons could be privacy reasons right could be so many reasons why this is not happening right and third is more analysis intelligence right so that the second part those connections start happening the analysis and intelligence will become even better and better right part right but there will always be limitations to the intelligence part right and there are, it's not that initiatives are not happening there are a lot of initiatives which are happening in different ways through which they are trying to take the data from step 1 to step 3 one of the initiative which i i i've been like studying a lot and really admire right is a smart on fire initiative right more an initiative around interoperability which i am seeing kind of spread which started in us few years ago but i'm seeing it entering the middle east and i've been hearing some conversations about that in india as well right by virtue of which how can all the data that resides inside the ehr platforms can be made available to the development ecosystem so that the innovation can happen so that the real ai can be seen and it is it 
just not remains something which is more data driven decision making but we will really be able to see the power of artificial intelligence which is here okay. it may appear as a lot of conversation to five years i strongly feel will be a big push Maybe okay. Yeah, you wanted to add. Yeah, so the smart fire is, uh, I think, uh, the example how governments and uh, the regulations are really forcing now the healthcare industry to adopt uh, this interoperability standards like fire and actually open up the data mine that they have been sitting on top of, and that is, I think, a very good step. where all the new technologies that we see uh, would then start getting much more penetration and engagement in these ecosystems i mean the first step is like all the data that the uh, patient has is available on their uh, fire servers and then the next step in that continuum is that data can be then fed by a patient going to a different healthcare organization or different hospital to uh, digital algorithms there are lots of very potent digital diagnostic algorithms out there which really need this kind of uh, data which can inform clinical decisions which can inform patient care pathways so i think uh, this uh, interoperability and then uh, that bringing more acceptance to the digital algorithms is i think uh, paving the way for a uh, lot more innovation and lot more faster pace of change in this area so um rohit i'll come to you to understand more uh, i mean as an investor what exactly do you look for and which are the areas you are keen to i mean uh, make headway when you are looking at investments in the healthcare space particularly um well it's a it's a tough question to answer i think if there was a root map to follow i think everything would have been solved for um so it's actually a little bit of uh, leap of faith and you know uh, trying to gauge what's the uh, what is one swimming in with right so i think it's it's uh, one thing that we'd like to see is um anyone who's thinking long and thinking strong right so um not just here for the moment to actually be able to make a difference but something which will actually have a lasting impact so technology may be the way to actually start that but the impact has to be real right um, like case in point again like what mudith has delivered it's taken 8 years but you know now uh i don't think most hospitals uh he's become like a core product in each uh or a medical equipment within each such new hospital which comes up as well right so i think it takes that much amount of time to actually be able to showcase the output that is possible um so i think for us we are looking at everything which is kind of enabling outcomes right and use the same three lingo as i did before on passion purpose and profit i think anything which cuts across these i think is super important um there are good avenues in terms of you know people who are helping on uh, you know like clinical decision support system on cdss as we call it um, he pl- he probably plays a good role in it so you know anything which is pushing or using technology to bring out more parameters and enable better decision making i think there's a lot of opportunity there um anything which is a one to many again where you know you are able to <coughs> overcome challenges in terms of providing access um if people are able to do that you know telehealth was a simple example of something like that uh, remote icu is something like that uh, there are so many people who are trying to build where you are not um, you know dependent on a one to one use case so anything which has like a one to many sort of scenario i think would be very very keen to kind of understand that a lot more um especially in pharma and such right there is so much of um ai again because of the computational capabilities which have gone up um, anything which goes and results in faster drug discovery faster gtm in terms of you know a life saving molecule um some of these are great opportunities but i think the other important aspect in india especially is uh, the whole role that abdm plays right simply because there is this massive promise of volume uh, more than anything in terms of you know the kind of outputs that are possible this is the one rational place where a lot of information is available i think anyone building on interfacing with abdm to actually be able to build out something of value i think there's a there's a huge promise again so these are some of the areas uh, that that i can think of at this time
So, uh, Harshad, coming to you, of course, uh, post-COVID, we have seen uh, a different segment emerging altogether in the healthcare space, uh, I mean, uh, and uh, health tech in particular. So, what kind of changes and trends have you seen and uh, in future also, I mean, uh, where do you think uh, that uh, the healthcare industry will further move ahead in the coming time? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, COVID is uh, kind of an era now. So, uh, BC and AC, before COVID and after COVID. I uh, think broadly, uh, there was a lot of kind of force to revert it back to the pre-COVID era, right? The, all the behaviors that existed in the pre-COVID era, uh, uh, I think everywhere people wanted to revert back, right? Few trends that we saw. Right? Adoption of telehealth, right? which increased massively during the COVID times. People used that, right? It, it worked for them. But as soon as everything became normal, everyone wanted it to become normal, right? Because with telehealth, it is, it is different, right? The, the care part right, is different, how it is delivered in real and how it is delivered in virtual. But at least, I think, a belief in that technology came and after it all a lot of it reverted back to where it was and seeing there is adoption in select used cases right where especially in the telehealth it is still continuing and it is above where it was in the pre-covid space right that's one uh, big area where i think the second big area i think is in adoption of technology by healthcare professionals Professionals. So, COVID taught, like, like all of us, COVID taught a lesson, right, about life, and and healthcare professionals also became consumers in this case. So, their adoption to technology also increased significantly, which I've kind of seen has stayed. Right? So, their adoption of new initiatives, their adoption of technology in the post-COVID area uh, uh, also uh, kind of stayed. That's the second big trend that uh, I've been observing. Uh, third, I think, big trend, if I go to the pharmaceutical marketing, right? so pharmaceutical uh, marketing has always been considered as a legard when it was about the adoption of digital as a channel. But again, COVID, because at the time of COVID, all the traditional ways they could not use. Sales reps were grounded, events were cancelled, so they, they did not really had any ways or means but to use and depend on digital as a channel, right? which has kind of stayed because it stayed there for a long time which led to a, a behavior change and I am seeing the kind of investments being done on that channel increasing year on year, even in the post-COVID era. right? And, and over a period of time, I think it will eventually result in making the overall marketing practice more efficient and should even start contributing to the cost of healthcare delivery as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Mani, Manu, coming to you, I mean, uh, do you also witness any trends you want to talk about from pre-COVID to post-COVID era? Well, uh, I really like the way you characterize the pre-COVID and <laughs> the before COVID and post -COVID. That's really accurate actually. I mean, uh, all of the barriers that we see about adoption of digital technology, especially with uh, healthcare professionals, um, for example, in Italy, where we had uh, a really bad uh, time with the uh, COVID pandemic uh, during the really, really peak, their peak uh, infection rates, uh, we saw really good adoption of uh, like physicians using uh, AI for uh, going through their chest X-ray screening and then using that as like as part of the regular workflow. So 100 text. So it really pushed the, uh, it, I think it opened a door for when it comes to uh, clinicians. And uh, one thing which I definitely see um, in the industry is a lot more reliance uh, and our acceptance on using uh, digital algorithms and recommendations and risk classifications and things like that, which is now actually being used instead of just being a demonstration piece and a hurrah moment for uh, some technologies. 
this is now actually being adopted by physicians. So that is a very good thing that I see uh, post COVID. Just as an example, especially on the clinician front, uh, pre COVID, I think adoption. Uh, at uh, Cloud9 across the system was less than 1%, I kid you not, uh, on uh, technology, right? Um, when I say technology, it may be uh, virtual consults, using the HIS, putting information in, remote working, collaboration, all of that. During COVID, it obviously went up to like 98%. There was still one or two who would still say that, no, listen, it's okay, I'll take a break, right? Um, we thought this was like a fantastic moment um, all things aside on what happened during COVID. But I think from a technology adoption, it went really way up. It actually stressed the whole system. A lot of wonderful inputs came in terms of you know, how to actually use uh, the kind of technology which is there. Um, now, on the post-COVID era, um, we see the settling at about 30 odd percent, right? So it has fallen down, but it's still 30 percent when it used to be less than 1 percent, right? So it's like a huge bump up. And we're still seeing a lot of value and throughput just by the 30% usage and this is like across one organization you can imagine across everything else that a lot of now critical inputs are actually coming decision making has become faster there is this um, very good uh, sort of adoption on what technology can offer which means that there is more to come more to enable and stuff right so it's actually very very exciting <laughs> Dr. Vishnu, coming to you, I mean, uh, the way uh, you've been working on Gen AI, what kind of challenges do you see in its adoption in the Indian market for the health tech space? Um, let me uh, answer this in two parts. One is uh, the, the medical, uh, the clinical aspect, and <clears> that one with health tech. So let me come to the first to the health tech. Uh, we saw a huge adoption of telemedicine, especially in US market. Uh, there was a big uh, merger also that happened between two companies, uh, telemedicine companies, uh, which resulted in nearly a $20 billion company, Teladoc. But if you see today, uh, Teladoc has virtually gone bankrupt uh, because uh, as predicted, uh, the adoption of telemedicine didn't go up and up. So it came down, uh, it was in its peaks uh, during COVID, it came down as like uh, Rohit was saying it came down to 30 percent here. So uh, that adaption is came uh, is much more higher than pre-COVID, but still it's not like everyone is just doing only telemedicine. Nobody wants to go to the hospital anymore. So uh, it's kind of hybrid. Even with the work, also it's same. It, I think in Bangalore now it's like three days I come to the office, two days I will take an off. So uh, it, it didn't become like uh, everyone is going to work from the office. So it's uh, adaption is increased. Uh, but still, uh, generative AI has lot more capabilities because we analyzed a lot of work that happens in the hospital. Uh, we have divided that. Uh, in fact, for every work, we have like a uh, ballpark figure on how much is real clinical work, how much is just like, you know, uh, we call it as intern mode, bringing x-rays, checking all like uh, the clerical work. For some provisions like nursing, it's nearly 60 to 70 percent is just like, this work rather than clinical work. This can all be automated. Imagine like even today from US to India, everyone struggles in the hospital is for the discharge slip. Discharge summary doesn't get printed, everything gets delayed and then the whole thing then. So this can all be, you know, automated, especially ASR, automated speech recognition, really revolutionizes this. That's where uh, the new generation technology can be really uh, useful. This is for health tech. But when it comes to the clinical medicine, like um, Mohit was saying that, you know, um, a lot of things have happened, we are going deeper. But you see, the whole COVID has taught us a lesson that the same people, COVID affected them in different ways. Many of us have just escaped without even getting fever and some people have, you know, passed away, like same age groups. So what was happening? It was not just, you know, the virus, it is our own body reacting there. So can we know like who will react how to this virus or for any disease? That's where uh, the next generation health tech is going. So we are working on protein-protein interactions. The same vaccine, same drug, it will act totally differently on you compared to any other people, though we are taking it for the same disease. Because the interaction is much more deeper, each body is totally different. That's where, uh, you know, um, the next generation clinical care is going to come from. 
Uh, so these are two kind of exciting things which we are like looking at from technology perspective. It might look bit futuristic, but this is where ultimately it's going to come from. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, we are kind of working on both of them. So we work on protein-protein interactions. There are like 20,000 proteins which we found out uh, in, in human body. Uh, and then when you see how clinical trials happen, we are just watching like five, six biomarkers and saying like, oh, these are the kind of uh, you know, side effects or uh, safety profile of the drug. But once the drug comes to the market, just take COVID vaccine itself. Later, as the uh, people started using, we have seen many things from like epicarditis to long COVID. All that was not as anticipated in the clinical trial because we were just looking at a very small profile. But once it started being used, millions and millions of people have thrown away so many things which were not there in part of trial. So this is where uh, we, we can do that now uh, much more accurately than uh, the current system using you know generative AI because like 20,000 proteins only generative AI has the capability to analyze each person differently. Uh, Madhuk, coming to you, I mean, uh, what kind of challenges you had in your journey while working with hospitals? Oh, many challenges, <laughs> right? As in, I think this session is not going to be long enough for that, right? So, the biggest, I would say, uh, one, right, which uh, even Rohit also pointed out was actually cultural uh, challenge. That, you know, um, because we are not used to using technology, uh, right, so much into the practice, that is the biggest cultural drift that, you know, uh, as a technologist, we have to drive. And again, and, and the good thing is, what has really happened is that, you know, even our expectation also, we have created a playbook of how this happens. Now, having done with two, more than 200 hospitals, now we exactly know how to drive that, right? Uh, in fact, we'll be very happy to, you know, share that playbook if anyone wants that. But, uh, you know, what really also matters is we really have to handhold, right? As in when someone is not adopting it, doesn't mean that, you know, they don't want it. Uh, it is just an aversion to something that they don't know, right? So what we really have to do is handhold them, make them understand how it is going to help them clinically, in their practice, uh, in, in different ways, right? The impact, how the business impact will be driven, how the clinical impact will be driven. Right, and how overall patient safety, patient satisfaction, and things like that go, uh, right? So in healthcare, as we say, right, what matters is real world evidence, right? So yes, you can have a great technology, but it won't be adopted until and unless you have very repeated nature of real world evidence, done at multiple level, done at, you know, clinical trials is one, but in each and every hospital, again, doing it, redoing it, showing them again and again that, you know, see every month that impact is being delivered, uh, right? Uh, and once you keep doing that, right, that becomes a habit to such an extent that, you know, uh, so Rohit was actually sharing that with me, that one of the hospitals he was interacting with one of the nurses who uses Dozy. So he was asking her, how has been the experience? And then she was saying that, you know, we really love it, right? So from the point that you know we don't want it to taking it we love it right there is a huge thing that goes on and uh, it is all about executional excellence and you know just being at it uh, right to drive that cultural change which is required and that is the hardest thing uh, you know one can do so yeah okay. so it's cloud nine <laughs> one of your no, no, it's, it was not. <laughs> you found a customer <laughs> i don't have a use case yet so <laughs> Maybe that's another opportunity to be explored in the coming times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we have lost the connection with Harshit. So uh, I think we have had uh, a fair uh, amount of interaction with our families on the and we have the audience to uh, uh, also raise their hands in case they want to ask them Can we pass on the mic here? Okay. Good evening, all of you. So I'm Shiva Shankari. So this question is for Dr. Vishnu. And like before COVID or during COVID, we've always heard about all the chronic conditions like diabetes or 
and alft and cancer for now is trending in uh, like every platform or every hospital you see the number of cases of cancer is just growing so busy as far as i heard it's working on the preventive measure of an alft care so can you add more light on that <laughs> yeah um so um let me begin with a simple thing um insulin resistance is one thing uh, which is like uh, the root cause of most of the problems uh, we face like 75% of the healthcare happens uh, in this field like um, uh, metabolomics and anything from childhood obesity to many forms of cancer are linked to this and insulin resistance is something which is much before than all the diseases we find like diabetes hypertension and it is such a simple thing to even diagnose like all you need to do is two three biomarkers to understand that and then take care of your you know um, wellness aspects especially the food which is like nearly 50 60% so this is as simple as anything can be but still we as a system as a healthcare system as a total system we have really failed in addressing this problem which is resulted into so many diseases and healthcare burden um, if you look at it um, only 7 8% people have really long problems and nearly 70 80% of the healthcare is spent on them but all the other people who are just going there waiting to happen uh, we don't really focus on that so something on that scale can really happen then it's going to be a big game changer in healthcare but yeah so that's what we are trying to do uh, uh, but uh, as you, uh, uh, you can ask any investor they will say preventive healthcare has nothing like we don't invest there come with huge thing like in sickness care it's very very investable any new drug is very investable so it's a it's a it's a kind of uh, difficult place to be in uh, <laughs> so right right <laughs> I want to answer that here. <laughs> okay. So, uh, hi everyone. So, this is from Dara Communications. So, fundamentally, I think uh, before we jump onto the health tech, I have a basic question about the because we talk we are talking about data here, specifically about health data. You know, uh, before we build the layers on top of what AML talking about building the analytics, uh, the most important part, you know, the building block is the data, isn't it? so how are we making sure the data authenticity right you know because without you know if the data is not correct whatever you build on top of it might not work it might work in the worst case you know other way around right when you're diagnosing you know a patient okay so what is the measures you know you think because uh, the data authenticity let's say for example uh, you depend upon a medical report and i'm just taking one example you know let's say for example we are talking about it's good to have remote monitoring it's good to have and hands off you know because going to a uh, hospital getting the test done for a 3 hours sitting in a queue and getting it done right rather you get a uh, blood sample collected at home and taking it to an uh, 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 lab for getting it tested right so uh, i'll take one example maybe in my you know my family's example wherein you take a pti and a test you get collect a sample and you when you by the time in thanks to bangalore traffic by the time you take it from a home to a lab the I, i heard from the doctors especially saying that due to the lapse and uh, lack of time you know you know for the pti and expects and taking one example pti and r you know if it changes when they more than a 15 minutes an hour the values change right so in this aspect how do i making sure because data authenticity is very, very much important you know unlike anything uh, any other things you know any other technology specific to health tech you know this is most important for you because for doctors and maybe doctor can help me uh, for the doctors data is most important they look at the report rather than you know anything else right you know you can't just look at a patient and say you are diabetic you just look at a paper and you know your data based on the test done so what is that measure you you know is is taken or uh, do you think it is a worth looking into the data authenticity before we build the layers on top of it on the layers top of it is quite important i agree to the point but what is it something being done in the bottom layer that's my question so no it's a very good question right as in the outcome of a the layer will be as good as the data which gets into that right in fact fundamentally because of that only when 
we looked to start this company, right? We really wanted to build the AI layer of it, right? But when, then we realized that, you know, for that, we require a very robust data system to build that. So first we created the device, right? To collect very seamless information first, and then and only then AI can actually work, you know, anyway, because when we started working with different set of sensors and all of that, we realized that, you know, there is so much variations amongst each. It's very hard to, you know, build systems which are, you know, capable of working all across. So therefore we had to take it in hand, right? So even today as well, even today, you know, we do partner for other kind of data from third parties, but then we go through a very strong scrutinizing procedure before we onboard anything. Right, uh, just to ensure how much we can rely on that thing, right? And the other way of, you know, kind of to see how good is the data is to sometimes also not fundamentally just depend on the data, but also to look at the changes in the data and the trends part of it, right? Absolutes might be, you know, buggy at times, right? But trends and changes are more reliable, right? So that is fundamentally how, you know, we have, you know, looked into that. But you know, again, you know, I'll, there are different perspective to this. This is not a one dimensional solution uh, because you know, not always you can go with vertically integrated product, right? So how you build layer, you know, relying on the system down below, right? Is very important question. I agree. I'll just, I'll just add to that. I think uh, what he said is absolutely right. Uh, in any sort of philosophy, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? So I think. The essential part, especially in healthcare, is no one's kind of saying that, look, this will come and this will become the new way. If you think of instruments, if you think of uh, testing methodologies from RT-PCR to now slowly moving towards imaging and such, right? So I think it will take its own time. I think everybody is conscious of the fact that end of the day, it is a human life in one way or the other. There will be enough sort of test cases built out, enough sort of clinical trials which will happen and stuff. But what is more exciting is given the kind of computational power there is and you know Dr. Vishnu can add to that is that time which it takes is probably shrinking, right? And so one at one, one end we have the adoption, there is the intent to adopt. The other end is you know all of us as consumers are asking for more. I think the ecosystem will evolve in such a way that you know there is enough sort of data points which are coming through that ultimately I think the error rate in terms of you know what was the agreed principle and outcome of a particular test or a procedure to what technology can ultimately give you. I think that's really where it is. You know it's the same which is happening with drug discovery, it's the same which is happening with uh, many of the devices like Moses Dozy, right? So there's so many more data points that you can actually bring in. It's just a matter of time. I think it will it'll get there. But yes, data is sacrosanct. You have to get it absolutely right. I think it's the m time to market which is shrinking. Just, uh, just a slightly different take on uh, how data authenticity. From where we are going, uh, from that angle, you are talking about before COVID, they are like 1% of users and now is 30%. So one, if you look at how healthcare data looks like in the real world, in, in actuality, the data which is really needed for making critical life saving decisions, they tend to be uh, placed at very high importance. There are validation, verification, all sort of scrutiny done to ensure that is actually correct. The part which is really bad and the data is fast, fragmented, are the data points that nobody really cares about because there is nothing in terms of analytics or AI or these algorithms which actually make the data important. So the way we are going, I think it's a two way. We generate more data, we do more with it. That creates more value, which creates more push to actually make the data more accurate, reliable, shareable, etc. So I think that's also good. Okay, so time to conclude the session, but uh, just one concluding point I want from each one of you is tech technology actually helping uh, us to reduce the cost of healthcare, a yes or no from each one of you? Oh, absolutely, yes. I think it will take time, but I think the ultimate objective for all of this is efficiency, right? It can be time, it can be cost, it can be uh, many other things, but yes, it eventually should mean um, that a lot of people should be able to access it and with the promise of volume comes that the price can actually go down. So yes, I think it should make an absolute difference. I really think the problem at our hand, really, especially in India, is access, right, as in 
we should not think about cost right now right first every indian is getting care or not is critical when we do that i think next step will be cost right and that that also technology will do but first step is uh, access yeah oh i i look at it from a slightly different perspective i think it can reduce cost not just by making it cheaper but by that we have technology we can detect things early so the cost of society in that case becomes lesser the burden on societal care i mean that becomes less that we definitely see happening with technology yeah uh, a technology uh, will <coughs> will work both ways um, if you see even the um, most expensive surgeries that were happening the cost has really come down you know it's been very um, uh, very less compared to like few years back because of the technology itself like currently we are <coughs> uh, there is a ct scan machine which they are working on even low end mri machines um, which are very cheap compared to what we used to get earlier so that will make only things cheaper and more uh, affordable accessible to people that's one part the other part is healthcare at a scale can also happen these days because <clears throat> the biggest bottleneck in healthcare are going to be the doctors and nurses like you can't create millions and millions of people of them so can we make them more efficient you know can they take care of more people in a better way that that's where another uh, different aspect where technology can really you know um help healthcare in so uh, these are the two extremes where i feel is uh, going to be a big game changer um uh, but ultimately uh, doctors and nurses will be the one who will be doing healthcare but can uh, technology really make them more efficient you know uh, cater to more people more uh, precise on that note of greater efficiency and accessibility and in future a reduction in cost we conclude this session thank you so much gentlemen and uh, great the kind of work which you have been doing i'm sure uh, the future looks promising enough and uh, i mean of course there would be more far more opportunities for everyone thank you